Okay, uh, so a few things that we need to say about last week. Last week he said the people in Corinth were a new church. They're figuring out how to be a church. And something they struggled with is they thought the people who could speak in tongues, who had that particular spiritual gift, were somehow better or more elevated or more spiritual than the rest. Then Paul comes and he tells them in 1 Corinthians 12, that's not the case. All gifts are equally important as all the members of a body are equally important. And he ends that chapter with the words that Lorna started us on today. After he spoke about gifts for the whole chapter 12, he says, hang on, before you think it's about gifts, I will show you a still more excellent way. Not gift, a more excellent way. And then we have the very well-known 1 Corinthians 13. A few things we need to say. Paul is not talking about romance. He's not talking about marriage. He's not talking about lifelong partnerships with someone and how love applies to that. That doesn't mean we shouldn't read it at weddings. Of course we can. But we must understand that Paul is concerned about how love is the way of spirituality. Spirituality is not how many days you can go without food. Spirituality is not how much time you spend in prayer every day. Spirituality is not how many spiritual gifts you may have and exercise. Spirituality is contained in your capacity to love. That's what he's on about. That's the point he's trying to make in everything he says in chapter 13. Uh, the clicker, where could I find the... Uh, now, is my cable going to be long enough? Uh, okay, very good. Let's quickly have a look again at our reading. Paul is saying, talking about spirituality, if I speak in tongues, in the tongues of mortals and angels, but I do not have love, I am a hollow instrument, a noisy gong, a clanging cymbal. If I have prophetic powers, if I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to move mountains, but I do not have love, it's all worthless. It doesn't mean anything. If I gave away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, you see that little A in brackets? I notice in Lorna's reading that is translated as, if I give away all my possessions and give up my body to be burned, if I give myself as a willing martyr and sacrifice to the enemies of the church, even if I do all that, but I don't do it out of love, I gain nothing, and we could add and no one else gains anything either. Love is patience. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. We know that piece very well. We can skip over it for now. Let's quickly have a look at verse 9. We'll start there and then work our way back. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part, but when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. Now when I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. I think it's important here to note that people in Paul's time did have mirrors, but they didn't look like our mirrors. They weren't um, manufactured to be completely straight and as reflective as possible and smooth. To look in a mirror in Paul's time was probably more like looking in a polished piece of metal. So you can imagine polishing the back of a spoon and looking at your reflection in that. You can see eyes and a nose and mouth and hair, but you can't really see in detail what is staring back at you. That's why he says, now we see in a mirror dimly, but there is a time coming when we will see face to face. Now. I know only in part, 
but then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now, faith, hope, and love abide, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Love is a funny word. Love can mean very many different things. Love can uh, be the love you have for your sports team, or for your church, for your school. Love can be the love that you have for your extended family and friends. Love can be something very personal, something very intimate. And love can be something that comes from God. We've got the one word. We might have words like affection and compassion that go with that, 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 that broaden out our understanding. But the Greeks uh, knew better than us that love is too complex and heavy a word to, define, to be defined by one term. And so the Greeks had three main words that they used for love. They had others as well. But the three that they mainly used, we know them quite well, is philios, which is a, which is a platonic kind of attraction. It's a love that doesn't go with any, any serious repercussions. So philios is the one kind of love that the Greeks described. The other kind was eros, where we get eroticism from. from. So that is the, the, the romantic, erotic love that you feel for a partner, for someone that you are attracted to. And then there's a third word, agape. And agape is the word that Paul keeps on repeating here. Agape is not like philios. It's not a mutual attraction. It's not some kind of necessity. It's also not eros. There's nothing erotic about it. Agape is unconditional sacrifice. That's the definition. The word of all the words in Greek that Paul could choose to use here is agape. He's saying unconditional sacrifice for the other. That is kind, patient, forgiving never ending. He does something else and our translations don't always help us. You would notice in your Bibles and in the reading we did that, uh, that, that from verse 4 onwards it's translated as love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not jealous. But when Paul writes he's not using adjectives. He's not saying love is insert adjective here. He's using verbs. And this is important because he's not saying love is patient. He's saying love acts, waits patiently. You see the difference? Adjectives can become very passive. Things that happen in the third person. But verbs are always active. They happen in the first person. Paul is deliberately using verbs because he is trying to tell us that this love cannot sit idly on the shelf. It must do these things to be the love that I describe. And so it's not love is patient. It's love waits patiently. Love acts kindly. Love does not envy, does not boast, does not brag, does not act rudely or unbecomingly. And then Paul uses, or the translations use the same verbs, it does not insist on its own way. We spent a long time at Bible study talking about what that means. Does not keep account of wrongs. Does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices actively in a verb form in truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, and in the next sentence will say, love never fails. Love never staggers. Love never falls down. Love is always there. This is why we so often say to each other in relationships with the people that we care for that love is not a noun. Love is a verb. And I had a preacher once ask us in a in a, in, in a church service, he asked us all to spell love. You know, he would say one, two, three, go, and then the people would spell out the word love. I'd like to do that same exercise with you and see if you fare better than, than, than we did. So, four words, uh, four letters, right? 
Um, actually, I shouldn't say that because it's not four letters. Anyway, let's give it a go. I'm going to say one, two, three, and then you spell out the word love. Got it? One, two, three. L O V E. Is that right? If you had spelled it correctly, we could all go home. Service done. But you spelled it incorrectly. Uh, you spell love E F F O R T. You spell love effort. You spell love S W E A T. B L O O D. T E R A A R S. It's bloody work. It's sweaty work. It's hard work loving. Because love is a verb. It's not an adjective. It's not a noun. It's not something that sits on the shelf. It's something that must be done to come into its own. Let's get back to the letter. Paul is writing all these things in 1 Corinthians 12 about gifts and gifts and gifts and all the different gifts, speaking in tongues and prophecy and healing and teaching and leading and apostleship. And then he says, put aside the gifts for a moment. I want to show you a still more excellent way. Not gift, way. I want to show you a way of understanding all these different gifts because they mean nothing if you do not employ them in the service of love love is not a gift love is the point of all the gifts love is not a gift that is given to some but not given to others love is given to all by the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ for our sakes and for our sins and for our salvation. It's not like the gifts, some are given to these and those are given to those. Love is given to all and we'll get to what that means in a second. But love is not a gift and we cannot look at each other in church and say, oh well, that person just has more love than the other. We all have the same love because we all have the same God and the same Lord. So if love is not a gift, if it's a way, what does that mean? I think that's where the dartboard helps us. You could take these darts, you could think about these darts as the gifts themselves. We could call them, we could write down on them labels, we could call this one healing, we could call this one prophecy, we could call another one speaking in tongues. And I can hand these gifts to the kids. But if they cannot hit the bullseye, then those gifts have not been used in love. Love is not a gift. Love is the point, the aim, the target, the goal of all the gifts. Maybe that's one way of thinking about it. Maybe there's another way of thinking about it. Love is not the gift. Love is the strategy behind the gift. Love is the way you employ the gifts. This is uh, Ali on the right and Foreman on the left. Rumble in the jungle. Ali was a very skilled boxer, but he was old. Foreman was a young man. Powerful, strong, fast. Everyone counted Ali out before the fight even took place. But Ali went into that fight knowing that skill-wise, maybe he matches up. But in terms of age, in terms of his ability to take a punch, in terms of his own speed and power, he probably couldn't live with Foreman in a fight, in a fist fight. And so you all know what he went out doing. He went out with a strategy. He lay on the ropes, bobbing, weaving. He let Foreman punch himself out in four or five rounds. He used strategy, and then when the moment was right, he struck. And he knocked out the most feared puncher in the heavyweight division. I think, there's a, I think there's a picture of that as well. We can talk about more examples of that. You watched the Australian Open last night? You would have seen strategy come into play. 
That girl that Ash Barty played, she hits that ball hard, man. <laughs> she returns that serve so, so hard, so, so quick. And for a moment, it looked like Ash Barty wouldn't live with her power. But she changed her strategy. She had all the skills in the, in the box. But you can have all the skills. If you can't aim them at the right target, you're like a hollow instrument. You're like a boxer who punches himself out in one round. And if you watched the men's doubles final after that, you would have seen the same thing. Very skillful players on both sides. But what do they call them? The special case. Kyrgios and Kokonakis, they played with a strategy that overwhelmed their opponents. They played with a strategy that fed off the energy of their road to the final. And the strategy won the game for them as much as their skills and their talents and their gifts and all the rest. Love. It's not the gift. Love is the point of the gift. This is such an important point for Paul that he will keep repeating it. And not only him, but John will keep repeating it. And Peter will keep repeating it. And Jesus himself will repeat it. You must love one another. If you call yourself a disciple of Christ, you must love one another. You don't have a choice. You can't hide behind, oh well, I'm just not a very loving or warm person. It's true, you might not be a warm person, but you must still love one another. The scribes will ask Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? They think they can trick him into saying something he shouldn't. He says it's easy, love. Love God and love your neighbor. Paul repeats it throughout 1 Corinthians and in, later, in his later letters as well. He says that there's one thing I need you to understand. It's this, you must love one another when john writes he says god is love the only concept that you and i have of love is the love that god himself showed to us in sending his son to live among us and to be arrested and crucified and then resurrected from the dead for our sakes john will say it in clearer language than paul john will say we love this is first john 3 we love because he first loved us. Paul will say it slightly differently. Paul will say, now we see in part, now we know in part, but one day we will know fully as we have been fully known. Now let's not kid ourselves. If it, would, if it were as easy as summing up 1 Corinthians 13 in a few slides, we would all be masters of practicing love. We would be experts. We would never put a foot wrong. It's much more complicated than that. That is why Paul doesn't take one sentence to describe love. He takes a whole chapter to talk about it. But there's a little bit of grace in all of this. There's a little bit of grace in our inability to love the way God clearly commands us to. And we find it in those final, final statements that Paul makes. Paul knows that this is a difficult thing to do. And so he says, brothers and sisters, we only see as if in a dim mirror. We cannot understand the repercussions of all our actions. We cannot understand how even our best intentions to love one another can go so spectacularly wrong. We see only in part the whole world sees only in part. The more knowledge we seem to gain, the more lost we seem to become. The world is confusing and chaotic and full of sin and evil and death. And because all of that is true, the best thing you can do for each other is to love. Not to speak in tongues. Not to have all knowledge. Not to lead your congregations in healing and services and songs. Not to claim that you have all wisdom or the strength of the apostles. If you truly want to serve one another in a world that has gone so horribly lost, you must, you must, you must love one another. Now love is greater than the sum of its parts. 
but Paul gives us many, many, many descriptions of what it contains. When you can wait patiently, whether it be a business transaction that you're waiting for, whether you've asked your children to clean their room and they haven't done it yet, if you can wait patiently, you love. If you can act kindly when the easy thing or sometimes the right thing might be to act without kindness, then you love. When you can listen to the accomplishments of others, even people close to you, without feeling envy. When you can spend time with people without having the need to boast about your own accomplishments. I love this one. When you can be in relationship with people in such a way that you do not insist on your own way, then you love. And you love with God's love. When you are genuinely upset by wrongdoing, when you weep at the injustice in the world, you love. When you rejoice in truth, you love. When you can bear more than you thought you could, when you can believe more than you think you should, when you can hope when it seems that there is no hope, when you find yourself enduring, even when you think it doesn't make sense to endure, then you love. But you must do it. You must will it into action. You must spell it E double F O R T. You must do it with blood and sweat and tears. Because if you don't, then you are a hollow instrument. We can turn this whole thing on its head. We can say you can be patient. But if you are sitting there waiting for this transaction to go through and on the outside you are smiling serenely but on the inside you are cursing this person who's causing you all this trouble and having you to wait, that's not love. You can say the words, I forgive you. But if you don't forgive in the deepest recesses of your heart, that's not love. Love is an all or nothing thing. Love is the point, the target that we aim towards. Love is the greatest of the commandments. I think there's one more slide. Okay, I took it out. Um, but if you want to practice this love thing, I suggest you go home. And if you have a diary or you have a journal, that's good. If you just have a scrap of paper, that's fine as well. Take a piece of paper and a pen. And tomorrow morning when you start your week, draw yourself a little archery target on that piece of paper with three rings, outer, middle, inner. And every interaction you have with another person tomorrow and the day after that and the day after that, just draw a little point on the target you've drawn for yourself. If you are hitting the bullseye, that means you've loved this person the way God intends you to love them. If you're out in the outer circle, that means you've got to work on that relationship, on that interaction, and bring it closer to the center. If you've missed the whole target, well, then luckily there's grace enough for all of us. Luckily, although we get it wrong, God doesn't get it wrong. But it's a good exercise. I've often done it with teenagers. Just for a week. Make yourself a target and plot every single relationship you have. And see how far you are from hitting the mark. And you can be honest with yourself because you don't have to show it to anyone. But you can look at it at the end of your day and you can say, well, before I had my coffee, I wasn't hitting the mark at all. But then I was close to the center. Or before midday, I was okay. Or at this place, I was fine. But when I went to that place with those people, I struggle. It's a good exercise. It's a good practical way because ultimately we know what love is. We just have a hard time doing it. 
So let's close our eyes. I think music team, you guys can come to the front. We'll close our eyes. We'll pray that, uh, that everything we've said about love will not just remain things we hear, but will become things that we do. Not for our sakes, but for those around us, as God's love is for our sakes, for our salvation, so that in everything we do, in every relationship we have, we may love one another to His glory. Let's remain seated, pray, then stand and sing our final song.